You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Morning, everybody. Hi, this is Mike Balzer of All Things 3D, and this is 3D in Review for the week of, or the end of the week of, uh, December 9th, 2017. So the theme of our show today is, is it possible? Let me read it. Budget VR backpack finally can play. Oh, geez. I had the wrong one. Okay, that's my opening. Will the killer VR app be the equivalent of a Tamagotchi? Hmm. So... Let me spin back the video I just showed. And one of the things that struck me in the opening of the lab, if you're not familiar with it, it is the, I would say the, I wouldn't say the killer app, but obviously a good demonstration of the capabilities of VR, which I think very few other games or applications have met as far as interactivity. Yeah, but most importantly is the way that they created, and let me bring them up, this little tiny character that looks like a little robot dog, but obviously it's only a 3D fabrication in the VR environment, but you can interact with it. Here I'm using my little control sticks and able to kind of touch it, rub it, and it responds to that. So it interacts with that. And I was just thinking, you know, back when my kids were younger, they all wanted the Tamagotchis. Uh, now, maybe some of you in the audience are younger than I and actually were one of those recipients of a Tamagotchi. And literally, people, it was like a rave to go out and buy one of these. And obviously, there were knockoffs that allowed the price to come down. But they were very reasonably priced. And literally, it was just an, a very crude graphic LCD screen, um, as well as a small processor that was a single app. And the whole purpose of it is by pushing certain buttons, you kept your little device alive. And a lot of people complain that it was being used too much in classrooms. You know, this is before smartphones. And now that we have smartphones, uh, we can obviously create more sophisticated versions of Tamagotchis on them. And then I just read somewhere that the Tamagotchi, the small little keychain item, is making a comeback. But then I thought, 
from a VR perspective, not only do you have the large uh, computer to work with, as far as your processor, your memory, uh, your hard drive space, uh, you also have the immersion of VR. And this could also be applied to a mobile phone. But being able to take your little controller and respond to an object, like here, all I'm doing is petting it. And, and then he interacts with it, scratching his leg. So a lot of effort by the animators within this to create a very real uh, object. And as you know, with Valve, uh, they've created some pretty immersive standard screen based um, games like Half Life 2. Uh, Portal is a good example of a fun uh, thinking game, but also had a lot of interaction with the characters in there. But imagine being able to have either a game or, like for instance, the lab, where this little creature kind of follows you around, wants attention, wants you to throw things, and he retrieves them. Um, but one thing that's missing out of here is, well, what happens after the demo? So imagine being able to pop into this and, and put out a bowl of virtual food and, and then like have it jump on your lap while you watch a, a VR movie or something. So the fact that we could have an interactive object that... Uh, and I don't know if you've ever tried this before, but if you haven't, go out there. It's on Steam. It can be run. As you notice, that's a mixed reality, uh, Microsoft mixed reality handset. So if you've got one, uh, make sure that you load up Steam. Make sure you uh, load up the Windows plugin, which I think is still in open beta right now. Uh, and eventually it'll just be part of the system. And download it. It's free. And it gives you a great opportunity to try it out. And one of the reasons that I was playing with it, and I'll bring this up on Tuesday in the 3D Tech Closet, is this allows, or I, I was using it with my budget VR backpack to kind of provide a, uh, a, a good demonstration. And this was the one that always was causing it to fail until I came up with a new power board. But that's more for Tuesday. But the ultimate thing is you've got this, and then there's this new... Uh, Star Wars Interactive, again, it's free that you can get for Steam, and it also works on the Microsoft um, Mixed Reality headsets, um, that you can interact with the robots like BB, is it BB-8, if I remember correctly, and uh, other robots. And not only do you interact with them, but you have to fix them. And this is all done through a VR environment, and it's very immersive, and, and in fact, it's very entertaining. And the other cool factor, at least with that, is that it's only five minutes. And so when you're done with it, um, you know, you just move on to something else. So for children, and obviously there's still a concern of how VR will affect kids, but obviously Google has thought that in low dosages, if for education, it is an extremely important tool. So again, by providing something like this, that's interactive, that a kid can try, uh, but again, we have to <clears throat> moderate its capability. So I don't know what your opinion is, but I think that this might be the killer app to create something like this, either in a game or a standalone that you, you have to don your headset on or your mobile VR headset and interact with your virtual pet. And, you know, the good thing is you don't have any cleanup. You don't have any expenses of food other than the app itself. So I think that's kind of a neat thing. In fact, it might prepare a child or, you know, a teenager, young adult before actually going out, spending the money uh, on a real life organic creature. And obviously it'll be far less expensive than the, what is the new Sony Ibo version two that's come out. I think it's like $1,500. Uh, so something to think about and hopefully we'll see more of these kind of things all right well i want to get into my other i wouldn't say theme but something i want to address here we're talking about the opportunity to to understand uh, other organic things through virtual reality have responsibilities and so forth so i'm a little concerned at what i've seen in the news or at least the vr news about these new 3d uh created guns uh, that are supposed to replicate uh, the actual gun itself that can be used in games. And, you know, I'll be the first to my mention that I also like shooters, uh, have for some time, but I also realize that there are some people that take it a little too far. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy behind the use of the Doom uh, engine in order to plan out the Columbine. So these are things that we need to consider. And one thing that I notice when using a uh, VR 
app or a game uh, with a shooting, for instance, I was just playing Arizona Sunshine the other day, is how realistic uh, the action was in order to shoot something. And the fact is you had to steady your hand. And a lot of these skill sets could be learned without actually having to go to a firing range. Not saying that you have to take the physicality out of it, but it can be utilized for repetition. The U.S. Army has already figured this out. And so I'm a little concerned when we take a controller, which, you know, even though it's a stick or ergonomically to fit your hand uh, and convert it into a gun. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, some of the items that that brought this to my mind. Uh, Road to VR had this article from Hands-On Striker VR's latest haptic gun prototype. Now, of course, this one looks very futuristic. <clears throat> but uh, with that being said, it still has a grip, still has a trigger, um, and now it has haptic response. So then now you also get a physical feedback uh, that you're shooting this particular gun. So the, the whole goal here is to replicate uh, a, an object that is, has a lot of controversy in the news. And uh, somebody pointed out on Reddit that, you know, these cool guns are coming out, but I live in Australia, so more than likely they're going to ban them. And I guess they do ban a lot of game type things. And uh, it is a huge controversy in the United States because uh, we have gun rights advocates um, who believe that they should have the right to own a gun. And then obviously with a artificial fake um, gun like this that's used in a game, uh, there should be no bounds as far as people having them. So with that, I did a search, which I'll move to, and for VR guns and look at all either prototypes or examples of the guns that are going to be made available. Uh, in fact, I saw this one here, if you can see my cursor, actually it's up here, uh, one at the first Portland uh, VR meetup that kind of left me a little bit sad uh, that this was one of the major items to show off a gun. And the guy was from Texas and felt like when I actually made the point of, well, now that we're in uh, Oregon, I know the gun laws are different. Uh, but I do kind of love guns, and I think this is pretty cool. But again, the this particular gun here is supposed to mimic, like have a cartridge that's used for the battery, mimic the the full purpose of a gun in a virtual. And here's another uh, image down here. And so we have all these different types of guns and weapons that are now being created uh, to be utilized in a virtual because, sadly, um, first person or VR shooters are becoming very popular. And, you know, frankly, having tried some, I can, I can see the enjoyment, you know, of shooting zombies or playing first person shooters. And again, you know, I don't want to bring up the argument, does this lead to violence? Uh, in my own personal uh, research that we did for our own seminars, we did find that there is some correlation and some people could be more susceptible of translating this. But, you know, uh, However you feel about that, um, that's you know up to you. Just be responsible, especially if you have your children and or young adults that you're wanting to implement this with. Um, you know, just be careful. Uh, kind of look at the the bigger picture here. But as you can see, gun type weapons for VR are are kind of becoming popular right now. All right, so let's move on to the next item, and uh, let's see what we have here. So this is another update from the past. Um, let's see, I think I have a video for this. That's still Striker. Another, okay. So if you've been following the news, this has been an important item, and this is the Vive Focus. Now, the controversy and why this has been in the news is that I guess Google, or at least there was an impression that the HTC Vive Focus was going to be a Google product, uh, but the reality it is not. It's specifically made for China and will be available on the 12th of uh, December for pre-order. And uh, there are two different types. I think the pricing was about 600 to 650. And let me go ahead and show a little video I've got of this. Let me find my little video. Here we go. Gotta work for it, work for it, every day work for it I stand alone, can't get much higher It's in my bones, the true survivor I stand alone, I 
keep on rising up to the throne. I won't stop fighting. Cause I stand alone. Well, there's a little video. It looks kind of funky. I don't know the ergonomics, but obviously um, we have a essentially a cell phone contained in this or a smartphone, the screen, uh, the IMU, the processor. This is powered by a Snapdragon 835. But the most interesting thing is the two little cameras in front that provide the six degrees of freedom. And so I did a little research on that. And this is what I came to the conclusion this is like a polished version of this and if you're wondering what this is i made comics excuse me comments about this uh, sometime earlier this is the snapdragon i'm sorry the qualcomm what do you want to call it developer version of what you just saw and i'll go ahead and go back to it and the noticeable thing are these two cameras in front here. So this essentially was the reference design developer's version that you could buy. I think it was like $1,500. And I decided to pass on it. And obviously you can now get one uh, that is commercial if you can get it on the gray market. I know there's like Gearbest and a few others that you could probably buy this from, but I think it'll be probably sold out you know in this country there may not be a lot of interest in uh, these type of things but let, let me get into the technology a little bit what makes this unique is that it uses two rgb cameras um, and providing a parallax uh, depth it's very similar to the hololens with its two cameras as well as the mixed reality headsets but what is different at least what i could determine this has a special oh, what do they call it now and i've already forgotten the name of it um a special um she's uh, dsp i think it was the term was hexagon that handles providing the depth information from these two cameras so that the actual processor itself is not burdened by the processing for determining your your six degrees of freedom or your inside out tracking positional tracking and this is what allows you to move around the room if you tried one of the microsoft mixed reality headsets um, i'm assuming it'll have probably a similar experience um, but also keep in mind that this contains a snapdragon 835 and let me jump back to the vive focus and see if there's any better pictures here so here they show some opera or some opportunities and then what will be available as far as the software but this is a special um, operating system specifically for this uh, this is the even though these are in chinese uh, obviously i have the english version of the images up here but <clears throat> getting back to it here so what makes this unique the fact is that you have a fully self-contained system uh, that is essentially a smartphone uh, that operates with an, a, a VR operating system very similar to Daydream or the Gear VR. And you have a hand controller. It is unknown at this type, and I don't think it probably works uh, like the Microsoft hand controllers. Uh, this is only a three degrees of freedom working off an access point uh, of a skeleton. So you basically have rotation of the device itself. It does not know where it's at in positional space. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure since I don't see any illuminating lights that you have on the Microsoft version of their controllers. So I'm assuming it's very much like the Gear VR or the Daydream as far as the controller is concerned. The other thing is because you have not only the screen, uh, the six degrees of freedom inside out tracking system, and the processor unit in this you also have to have a battery so essentially like i said it's about a smartphone and it may have a larger battery i don't know um, how many hours this thing will run but like i said its chinese price is about 600 for the white one 650 for the blue one here so many people are thinking this is dead on arrival maybe in this country um, but in china we're having a larger system, the power uh, to be able to set it up and the cost uh, may be a little bit overwhelming. Something like this could be donned in, you know, mass transit uh, in a small apartment. 
So this might be something more likely, unless obviously if you're a game player, you might want to go with a beefier system like the HTC Vive. But being, I think it's about $800 in China, being $200 less, people may move in this direction. And they're not the only ones. Uh, some of the other Chinese companies uh, like Huawei, let's see, Pimax, uh, some of these other VR vendors are also going to be supporting this reference design. So it'll be interesting to see what their designs will look at. So again, glad that it looks, even though I still think it's ugly, <laughs> at least it's more polished than this thing, uh, which uh, may have been another factor in why I didn't get it. Okay, so let's move on to the next item. TP cast. Yay. No, I don't know. Uh, here we go. So TPCast is finally coming to the United States. Uh, I had actually placed one on order through the Microsoft Store. And uh, sadly, let me jump back to my screen, sorry. So TPCast. And so it's finally coming to the U.S. market. And they're off actually opening up a office in the Silicon Valley, uh, obviously to support and probably handle the supply there. Um, it is only available for pre-order, so if you go out to shop, there you go. It's two ninety nine, and you can buy now. But I don't think it's available to actually sell. But I want to make a a point. Let me jump back see if they've got some images that kind of bother me about this. Can't see it there, and they kind of hide it. Some of the pictures that I saw with this thing. Um, Maybe there's some here is even though they show it aligned on the top of this particular remember this is the htc vives uh, newer uh, head mounting system i noticed in some of the pictures and they don't have any here it lops off to one side so i'm wondering how secure it is on the top of your head plus it's extra weight on top of your head i always already feel that the htc vibe is one of the heavier headsets so adding even more weight to it will make it a little cumbersome uh, and then you have a transmitting module that needs to be attached to your computer and then there's another piece that they don't show here uh, that hangs off the back or hopefully uh, you can run it on a clip on a belt um, because then that's a lot of weight on the back of your head. So what are the advantages of it? Well, obviously, you don't have to put a computer on your back, but you clearly have a limitation of range. I talked with them. Uh, so even if you buy this, don't expect to do more than a standard uh, HTC Vive area. If you're trying to make this work with some of the newer HTC Vive coming out next year with the new light towers and the sensors in the headset that allow for you know, up to... Is it 30 meters by 30 meters? Uh, a very large environment. This will not help you. So keep that in mind. If you're expand, expecting to expand your space or you're planning to open up a VR cave of some sort, this probably will not uh, do it for you. And there are a few other companies trying to come up with something similar. Okay, so these are things from the past. Let's move on to our next item. And uh, let's see what we've got here. This is from Science Advance. This is a new type of uh, volumetric additive uh, manufacturing complex production. Yeah, I can't even talk. Let's see if I can actually bring up the article. Here we go. Here's some images. Of it. But what's important about this is instead of using a single laser like you do with the, uh, the form lab, uh, this actually splits the beam off just like a hologram. And then actually, as you can see here, here's the laser. It's bounced off of this phase only SLM. And what it does is it allows the multiple beams to actually interact with the material at a lower uh, transmission uh, energy level. And then by concentrating three beams as shown here, it can solidify the material at that point. So what does this mean? That means that you can now, by just repositioning these beams, literally form and harden the material while it's in the resin, uh, meaning that not only can you create an exterior shell, as you see here, but you can also create interior objects. Now, obviously, these are all, uh, as you can see in these, these items here, they're, they're kind of crude, 
but like many things, if you remember the early days of at least the the personal 3D fabricating devices, uh, a lot of the models were very crude. Uh, so the fact is that we actually even have some of these available. Uh, I think this is going to be very interesting to follow. And this is being researched. Where is it being researched at? Uh, it doesn't say. Uh, it does. I, I just lost where it was at. Um, but here's a great article, describes uh, not only the process, but uh, talks about some of the, uh, the deficiencies, excuse me, deficiencies in current systems. And then obviously they talk about, uh, about the sciences and even some of the mathematics and how to actually get to this point. So it's a very good article, uh, a paper on this. And then if you want to know more about it, you know, uh, the show notes will have the link to it and go out there and take a look at it. I think this is going to be a very promising technology. Here's another little, uh, so that talks about the, the beam splitting. And as you can see, the different images based upon the angular displacement of the beams themselves. But I think this is a very cool idea. And the other option, not only can you print things without supports, um, objects within objects, but you can also uh, very quickly print because you're literally forming very quickly an entire mass um, instead of having to do it by slices. So they say it really minimizes the time that it requires in order to print something. So this is something, I mean, there's a lot of things to follow, but I think this is extremely exciting. And sadly, I don't rem remember where this actually came from. Oh, well, you can find that out yourself. I will have this in here. You can download the PDF for it if you really want to study it. But uh, yeah, it seems very exciting. Okay, let's move on to the next item. Uh, I thought uh, this was very interesting, and I don't have the full paper because you have to pay for it. But E. Megan, or Magan, I've talked about in the past. In fact, I have one of their earlier consumer VR headsets. But what they're known for is creating very small um, LCD and now organic or OLED type panels that can be fit inside a small headset. And one of the things that I remember seeing, and you can look this up uh, a few years ago, is a, not even, maybe a couple of years ago, kind of like a steampunk um, Walder's goggles. And it was a full self-contained VR headset. And I was very interested in my own designs of going out and finding this panel. So I had contacted them. And what I found out is that this particular panel uh, was about $3,000 to $5,000 because they really hadn't pushed the, the mass production portion of it. So this was like one-off uh, manufacturing process, mainly used for government and the military. Um, but they have refined the process and... Let me see if I've got, here's the article itself. So this is their press release on it. So here's the article. And the big thing is, even though it's not a, a huge problem for standard panels that are much larger, this is the number of layers that are normally created in order for you to see red, green, and blue. If you notice here, you have emission devices and then you have filters on top of it. And with the their variant, they have the emission devices without any filters. So obviously you can see here there are layers that are reduced and it also simplifies the simplifies the manufacturing process as well and uh, in also making it thinner. So uh, as mentioned with a larger panel, the method on the left is not significant in adding size or thickness, but with a very small, like one inch by one inch panels uh, that can contribute to it. The other thing is, since you're not running it through a filter, you have a higher emission. This thing I think is supposed to have, yeah, 5,000 uh, CDM M squared, uh, which is the method of determining brightness, which is fairly bright. And uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind as well. The other thing is that this is very compact a full 2K by 2K, and it does it give the size, I think it's about a, a one square inch, which is significant because that literally fits right over your eye. And obviously, you we probably have read about other companies providing something similar in the past, um, but uh, I don't think they've ever come to market, I think with a lot of hype. Um, but Emagan does, or Magan, does appear to be moving forward with this, 
and I have no pricing yet. I've reached out to my uh, representative at the company to see where this is going to go. And uh, uh, it's really exciting because this could really, uh, obviously 2K by 2K is about what we're seeing now per eye. Um, actually, no, we're seeing about, about 1400. So this is an increase in that. So this is like a 4K panel divided in two, obviously, and providing 2K per eye. So you'll get better resolution. More importantly, you're going to get something about the size of small goggles. Like I said, uh, 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 welding's goggles or steampunk goggles. And I think that's going to be extremely cool and would make uh, VR headsets more comfortable, lightweight, and actually kind of appealing if you're into the steampunk look. So looking forward to that, and I will keep up with this as well. All right, let's move on to uh, 3D and design. And I'm only bringing this up because on Monday, back in 1972, the Apollo 17 landed for the last time, well, actually the only time, uh, but the last time that the Apollo program landed on the moon. So one of the things that was known about the Apollo 17 flights was a ton of images, high resolution images that were taken. And a lot of them were panoramics where they put them together. So in fact, I remember uh, my dad who was an analyst uh, for the military had obtained some, some high resolution images because uh, he also worked at Wright Patterson uh, Air Force Base. And uh, I remember those vividly, extremely um, high definition photographs and here are a lot of the images that were taken, and I want to find one in particular. Uh, there's a bunch of them. And so the whole point is you can grab some of these and you know either map them to a sphere or some uh, viewers that you can buy for your mobile device, if you've got a headset for them, can be just viewed as is, and you can at least get 180 degree uh, panoramic. In some cases, some of these are full 360, and look at them and actually be on the moon based upon an image. So let me see if I can find one. Here's one here. And this is obviously not a large room. That's from space. That's not what I wanted. Uh, where are we at? So as you can see, there are a ton of them. I should have had one up and running beforehand. Uh, I did download some. All right, let's take one. This is a high resolution image of a boulder. So again, it's a little bit of a panorama, but they have some that they've clipped together with multiple and they're of high resolution. And you can literally put this in your headset and pretend like you're on the moon for the last time. So again, that uh, the anniversary for them landing on it is on the 12th. So you'll probably see more of that in the news. But I just thought this might be very interesting if you wanted to recreate the moon based upon high uh, <clears throat> resolution images from their uh let's see is this i don't think this is their website meaning nasa's uh this is a multimedia library yeah so it appears that uh somebody just brought them all and created a large uh, repository and made them available for free so there you go if you want something to uh tinker around with let me know if you actually create something i'd like to review it and possibly put it on the show Okay, so let's move on to, and that's about the only thing I have in design. Uh, so let's look at two items in 3D and medicine. Uh, the first one, you know, last week we talked about how Stratasys has a uh, 3D printer that can print different, uh, not only textures, colors, uh, but also uh, the uh, pliability. I, I don't know what I'm looking for. The uh, well, so I guess texture, but the compliant of the material itself. And uh, the problem is the Stratasys is fairly expensive. This particular university out of Minnesota, their researchers have come up with a way to actually print silicone. And since silicone has similar properties to the, the human organ, uh, they were able to, as you can see here, and I actually have a video and I'll go ahead and play that right now. Uh, so let me jump up and find it. Here we go.
summarize the advantage of this it mimics the texture and the compliant uh, uh, of a uh, organ tissue uh, as they showed there they actually could build in sensors so that you needed to determine pressure uh, it also simulates uh, tissue so that when you uh, suture it um, it obviously mimics that as well and, and then they actually had a another unique feature where they were doing uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, procedures inside the material. So the, obviously there's a great many things that can be done using this kind of technique um, to simulate before actually moving into a human body. Uh, so this is really promising. As you saw there, it looked like it was just like a nozzle uh, building layers like a standard 3D printer, but it was silicone instead of uh, plastics. So very interested in that. Again, it's in the research phase, but it doesn't look like it will take much to move this outside of it. It may still be somewhat expensive, but uh, in order to create custom uh, silicone-based organs and tissues uh, for experimentation, in particular, based upon the MRIs of an individual, I think is very critical in providing great health care and surgical procedures. Okay, and the other item is kind of a a happy story and I have a little video for this as well um, so I did look this up if some of you are wondering oh no is this a pit bull no it is a smaller pit bull variant uh, as they indicate here in the story this was a uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier which I guess is a very friendly dog but it's very muscular and more than likely it did get in a fight which crushed its jawbone and i'll let the video explain more of uh, what was involved in this <laughs> Obviously, another sweet story um, about using technology uh, in order to provide an adaptive, obviously, it's kind of a uh, cast structure, 
in order to support and maintain uh, a certain certain amount of uh, what would you call it uh, lack of motion in this particular area so that the bones could heal again by taking and this, I think that was a CT scanner taking CTs of the dog's facial structure and skull structure and then applying that to a mold and then 3d printed in order for this particular dog to provide support so that it could heal properly and as you can see in the results of that video it turned out successful so again you know we've talked about this before and how we can utilize this and uh, chris if you remember is working a vet uh, working with limbs in order to experiment and test um, pins and so forth in dogs that have fib fractures. I talked to a vet the other day and they could see this being extremely important because since there are so many breeds with so many physical differences, um, having the information through a CT or an MRI or in most cases bone structures from a CT, uh, this will allow them to custom make uh, and test certain things that they normally could not and because of the, the wide variety of bone structures, uh, this is going to be extremely important. And the process is not that expensive. And as indicated here, it didn't take them long to actually create this and provide it so that the dog uh, would be able to heal properly. So another benefit of, as I call it, 3D in medicine. All right, so let's move on to scanners. I thought this was super cool because one, I am very interested in, <clears throat> and the only reason that I would want an iPhone 10 is for the true depth uh, sensor in it. And looking through the uh, framework of the AR kit and now having uh, some ability to actually derive the motion capture information or the facial capture, this individual has actually applied it. Uh, it doesn't mention the company here doesn't seem to uh, and I actually have a little video of this as well but the the company here if you are a person that works with unreal is kite and lightning and what they did is not only are they coming out with a VR game but they created a little plug-in that you can work with or actually I know they didn't create it but uh, they had a nice tutorial because they used it in order to uh, capture frames for the video of uh, and i can't think of the name of the game it's the one that just came out it wasn't a vr game but uh, it had some very interesting effects and i had shown it earlier of allowing uh, the main character to look very realistic a lot of motion capture as well as facial capture and so this team who's applying some of these techniques for this weird game, but I'll go ahead and let the video play and then we can talk about it afterwards. Okay. So, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, can I get some uh, motion capture happening with the iPhone? Huh? I mean, it was a, it was a good idea. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty good. I think it's pretty good. Well, this goes on for a few minutes, so and I'm going to go ahead and cut it, it off now, but you can watch the thing in entirety and look up more information. I was hopefully uh, going to find some information to contact him, which I may do. <clears throat> later on in the week, but it would be interesting to know if he's actually going to create a, an app that allows you to do this. I hope so. Um, but the fact is that it is possible. Uh, I may also look into this. And so what he's done here is not only does it capture his uh, facial features, but it takes those blend movements and applies it to a model from the game that I guess they're working on, which I guess is a bunch of baby-like characters in gangster land or something. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but there you can see the phone and then as you can see in the end there that's his face um, and again by looking at the front facing true depth camera and like the emojis uh, that you can animate he is now doing this with a standard 3d object more importantly he can take this information out of the phone and apply it uh, to maya 
to its motion. I can't think of the name of it, but the animation uh, features in that and then apply that directly to his models. He says it's somewhat crude, needs to be refined, but he sees great promise for it. And uh, that's exciting news because this is one of the reasons at, you know, for a phone, I think it's expensive at a thousand, but for a capture device that you have in your pocket, um, it seems extremely interesting. And one of the things that he's looking at doing is mounting this to a headset so that not only can it capture his facial uh, gestures, but also uh, because it's mounted to his head, it can, uh, another type of motion traction, excuse me, motion tracking device will capture the rest of his motions at the same time. So the whole event can be acted out, which is when you really want to do it. And if you've seen Avatar and some of the behind the scenes, as well as this unreal demo that I can't seem to remember, um, clearly the best way is to have them act out while capturing their body movements with their facial gestures because they're acting out the entire scene. And so he's looking at possibly creating something like that. So I'm going to hook up with him and see if uh, uh, he might be interested in looking at some of my uh, helmet designs that I created for my uh, my own Yodi IO Yodi VR. Um, what is it? The pocket. So the head mounting thing that has an adjustable clip so you can put any phone into it. So I'll, I'll see if he's interested in that. Now, it may have to be done in portrait mode, so I would have to retrofit it, but he might be interested in looking at that. Oh, well, so let's move on. So let's see. That's about it. No, I have one more um, for the scanning. This is I thought was very interesting. There's a company out of Germany who is accumulating photogram photogrammetry-based uh, scans of celebrities, and even though they're database, and I won't go through them, don't really have anybody that I recognize, um, but there are, excuse me, their efforts are to open up different offices and have uh, captures of different celebrities and create a database so that if you need a particular celebrity as a model and something that you're working on, uh, you can then sign up. And they're opening up uh, another office in Germany, so I don't know if it's going to become worldwide, um, but obviously this is an application to scan uh, a lot of people for photogrammetry purposes. Uh, there's another company called Anatomy, <clears throat> I think 360, that has a lot of photogrammetry um, models uh, that you can utilize. Uh, mainly, f I think their their application is to study if you're a 3D designer, um, but you could probably rig them as well, and they're very realistic. All right, let's get into VR Corner and Around Room, and now we have um, a couple of things. I think, what do I have here? Three different items. One of them, um, I'll bring up a little video, but I thought this was cool, and I should have uh i don't have it so we'll just play it here huh, i thought i had it um we don't need sound so oculus has come out with what they call the dash system and uh i guess because both the htc vibe or steam has recreated in beta right now their new environment and then also the uh as you're probably aware, Microsoft has worked hard to create the Cliff House as their launching platform. Um, Oculus has also moved forward in creating their own. And <clears throat> essentially, I played with it the other day, and it's pretty cool. And essentially, you can recreate your environment, but you can also, here we go, it, because it's a dash, you can also... Uh, use it to control different applications, similar to the previous launching area. Um, but you also have a desktop mode now, so you can get access to your actual desktop, uh, which, if you remember, can be done in the HTC Vive and as well as the um, the uh, Microsoft Cliff House. So there you see a demonstration. Uh, the other thing is that you can customize your full environment. You can bring new items in. You can interact with things like basketball. In fact, you can set up a hoop um, and throw basketball hoop, I guess. I don't play basketball. 
good at one time, wasn't very good at it. But uh, so I thought that was pretty cool and I have played with it. I think it's going to be a welcome addition. So all you need to do if you want to try it yourself is just enable the beta feature in the software. And there's a couple of guides on how to do that. Once you do that, then you'll get access to it. And I think it's, it's enjoyable. It was worth a, uh, a few minutes of time. Um, but like I mentioned, the dash comes up and you can have access to all your other VR apps. So if you're not uh, interested in creating your own little VR hangout location uh, and they have multiple backgrounds, like you saw, he was in the middle of space. Uh, you can be in the middle of a city or you can be in a very serene environment. So there's a lot of uh, variables and uh, options in order to create your own little world. Okay, so the next item is, uh, we just, I actually didn't show it, but I'm going to right now. Um, I'll go ahead and show the video first. This is something I captured. <laughs> Microsoft Mixed Reality Headset, Acer Headset. So I'm doing all of this, which is available on Steam, through the Microsoft Mixed Reality Headset. I did notice, and I don't know if it's just my system, so I have to try it on a beefier system, but I did get some, one of the uh, cameras, my cameras, the eyes seem to have a little bit of shadow in there. And as you can see here, the frame rate, because I'm capturing this using the Clickhouse video capture system. It's a little jerky, but it's one of the cool things about this capture system is the quality of the video somebody got. In this case, it's a little jerky, but I think they're kind of pushing the boundaries with the little demo here. But regardless of the juddering or shuddering frame rate, which is so distracting. Okay. It's very fun. Again, another interactive use of small robots that you can interact with. And here you're actually repairing these robots with a simple things to it. Nothing complex. As you can see, he's looking around. So now that he's been repaired, he's like I said, it takes about five minutes to do. And uh, so it's very quick, but it's a nice little great demo um, application that you can use with your HTC Vive or the Microsoft Mixed Reality headset. And even though for some reason it isn't made specifically for Oculus, you can modify it so that it will work on the office as well. So not, not and, uh, the fact is that you can use it in place of the with three platforms now. There are a few others, but they don't have the hand controllers in the six degrees of freedom, so these are the only ones I really talk about. And with the Microsoft version being so expensive and being bundled with computers, I think it's a nice way to do it. You get money and you don't have to pay for it. So, this is really fun. As you can see there, I'm moving the DDA around. And then you have to do this with a few more robots. So, like I said, it's about five minutes. So nothing better to do. Come on, BB-8, hurry! Fantasy. I think I was 18, so I wasn't that young. But uh, for some of you, you may not have even been born yet before this came out. So try it out. It's pretty cool. I really like the way that uh, the ILM uh, Special Effects Lab has come out with these really cool VR, and they obviously are getting more and more sophisticated each year. So try it out and see what you think. Okay, so let's move on to my last item, <clears throat> just in time for the holidays. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and start playing it. <laughs> Another zombie apocalypse series. Now, if you remember, kind of is fun for me because I used to play Left 4 Dead uh, with my adult kids, or actually Siobhan's adult kids. So instead of being cozied around a 
fireplace we uh, signed in to uh, steam and all played left for dead and left for dead has four people what's neat about this one even though it looks very similar this was done in the unreal gaming engine it is in vr um, but you can play co-op with some co-op with three different people and then I think you can have teams of three plus three for PvP. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, that's something that they did talk about. So if you're familiar with Left 4 Dead, you can see that the, the, the game the graphics look very similar. But as mentioned, this is done with the Unreal Engine instead of the uh, Valve's engine. So, if, and I think this is coming out on the 29th, so it'll be a little bit after Christmas. Um, if, you, if you sign up for it, you can get access to the data and as well. I may shoot up a few zombies uh, this holiday. But that's kind of funny because I did mention something about guns and shooting earlier in the podcast. So even I am susceptible to the enjoyment of shooting a few zombies. All right, so let's move on. I think that's about it. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, so this holiday, I think it's the 29th, you can get early access to that game. Um, but don't hesitate to get the free Star Wars and also the free new Dash if you've got an Oculus unit. And uh, on that note, I will leave you guys and uh, see you Tuesday if you want to join me in the 3D Tech Closet. What am I going to be covering? I'm going to be covering the Breckel uh, facial. Remember, I covered the motion capture portion of it. Um, but this uh, Tuesday, I'm going to cover the face tracking. It basically has a similar... Uh, work environment um, but it's geared specifically for the face um, it did take a little bit more effort to get it up and running but once i did it seemed to track my face pretty well and then we can talk about what it actually captures and how to apply it and then we're going to convert the motion tracking information from the previous uh, uh, 3d tech closet episode to Unreal. If you remember, I mentioned that uh, I did obtain data, but the skeleton structure didn't match. So I should have that done and we'll be able to, I'll be able to demonstrate that, how to do it yourself. And then finally, I'm going to, because I have more time with this show now, I'm going to give a step-by-step -step <clears throat> process if you want to build your own budget VR backpack. The pitfalls, and now that I finally got one that is reliable, I can tell you exactly which power board to buy uh, so you can actually do this for yourself. And then, obviously, some critical points uh, to keep in mind if you do want to build one. Uh, I found that even though the processor that I use, which is a KB Lake, was rated at 25 watts, and the GTX 1050 Ti was rated at 75 watts. Um, I found that most of that was in the 12 volt power rail, and a lot of these smaller uh, DC to DC converters did not have the proper wattage for the 12 volt rail. Um, so I've had to bump it up to a larger wattage power board. But now that I have, I don't get any more crashes. And as you saw in my initial, and I'll go ahead and play it to end this, but uh, in my my little uh, uh, use of the John Valve VR experience, is now able to run this on my budget. Our backpack, which really has an i5 KB Lake. And I do recommend my system only has 8 gigs and you keep the price down, but I do recommend the one who sees. Also, something that I have noticed too is the GTX 1050 
make sure you get the variant with the four gigabyte. And the important thing is with the, even with the 80 watts per hour Anton Bauer battery pack, I can get about an hour's worth of battery time. And so you can get something with twice that capacity. And then you can make a double load. So we're going to talk about that the parts you need and uh, why you should do it. You don't actually have a system. Okay, so I'm going to leave you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye.